Okay, welcome and thank you everybody for joining today's webinar. My name is Amy Horton. I'm the Director of Sustainable Business for the Outdoor Industry Association. Um, you may have noticed we switched up the format of the session um, just a bit and that is because we are so fortunate to have longtime climate champion Senator Sheldon Whitehouse um, able to join us today to share his insider perspective on uh, what he thinks can get done on climate policy in the 117th Congress, and importantly, how you, the outdoor business community, can uh, play a role and be a partner. So we'll invite him to the stage in just a moment, the virtual stage, of course, but first, just a bit of context before we dive into the discussion today. So many outdoor businesses are committed to climate action. We have uh, nearly 100 uh, members representing more than 20 billion in um, annual sales revenue who have joined OIA's Climate Action Corps. Here they are. Um, these companies are committed to reducing and removing greenhouse gas emissions in their operations and their supply chains. We have a bold goal in the outdoor industry. Uh, we want to become the world's first climate positive sector by 2050 or sooner. And this uh, 2050 date we're ra working on ratcheting up that ambition. It's likely to be 2030 as we move to kind of reset our strategy. So climate positive, that is we, uh, our aim is to remove more carbon from the atmosphere than we emit. So not only reducing uh, our greenhouse gas emissions in our operations and supply chains in line with science, but also again, removing more carbon from the atmosphere than we emit. And that's ideally in ways that are beneficial to the outdoor recreation economy. Uh, things like reforestation, um, protecting, preserving, um, and enhancing ecosystems like grasslands, wetlands. Um, this is super ambitious. We know that, but we believe at the Outdoor Industry Association that if any industry should be leading on climate action, uh, it should be the outdoor industry. And I, I don't think I need to remind anyone in this audience that the outdoor experience upon which our businesses depend is under threat from climate change. So that is why OIA as the Trade Association for the Outdoor Industry helps its members with ambition, um, creating a sense of urgency um, and helping you to take action on climate. So uh, last thing I'll say before we uh, bring Senator Whitehouse into the discussion is Climate Action Corps members also commit to advocate uh, as a part of their work in the Corps. Um, we want to help pass policies that do all the things at the high level um, on this slide, incentivize businesses to take bold action to reverse the climate crisis, um, preserve land and waters as natural climate solutions, invest in green infrastructure, parks and paths to help build low carbon climate resilient communities, and very importantly, um, accelerate a just transition in our country to renewable energy. So we are very optimistic um, and hopeful about many of the recent executive orders um, and, and actions by the Biden administration. Also the, um, the energy package that was passed in, in late 2020 and the bipartisan nature of, of that progress all give us hope. Similarly, these announcements coming in from the broader business community like GM's recent announcement to, by 2035, no longer sell gasoline-powered vehicles. Um, all of this is exciting. Um, the common theme is bold action, uh, but we are, we are cautiously optimistic about um, what can happen in Congress, um, knowing we have kind of narrow margins in, in both chambers. Um, we've got moderate. Democrats that we, like Senator Manchin, um, that we hope to work very closely with to find solutions. So uh, with that backdrop, I would like to invite one of my personal climate heroes to join us, Senator Whitehouse. We'll invite Senator Whitehouse to turn on his camera and unmute, join us here on the virtual stage. So Senator Whitehouse has represented Rhode Island since 2007. Uh, he's spoken on the floor. Hopefully you have seen them. If you have not, go check out his um, Time to Wake Up speeches. He's spoken on climate change at least 279 times on the Senate floor. Um, as an Oregonian, 
I just want to thank you in particular for your work on oceans and protecting ocean and coastal ecosystems. Um, Senator Whitehouse, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Amy. I'm delighted to be with you and really appreciate the opportunity to have this conversation with the Outdoor Industry Association. And it's really timely because we are at a really significant inflection point. The last election I got rid of President Trump, who was an enormous obstacle to climate uh, progress. He wasn't just uh, in the way, he was deliberately obstructing. And um, in the Senate, we have new leadership and uh, we do not have the blockade of um, Mitch McConnell, who was gonna stop essentially any serious climate bill, even if it had pretty broad bipartisan support because it divided his caucus, it offended his fossil fuel donors, and it created difficult votes for the climate deniers who still inhabit the uh, Republican Senate caucus. So if you were in the business community and you were looking at President Trump and Majority Leader McConnell, you could pretty rationally say, why bother fighting for climate action in Congress when we're up against those insuperable uh, obstacles? Um, the Biden administration has come in and, as Amy pointed out, has shown enormous strength in its personnel selection, in what it's telling its nominees and appointees about how important climate is, in what it did in its opening set of executive orders, and in the regulatory goals that it has made clear it will pursue within the executive branch of government. So I'm here to talk about my preserve the uh, legislative branch of government and where we are in the Senate. And if you will indulge me, think about Congress as its own little ecosystem, a little bit separate from the larger ecosystem that corporate America inhabits, sort of like those movies where you find a lost valley that has its own peculiar creatures and uh, situations. Um, and I'm your field biologist from the Lost Valley. I've spent 14 years here now, and I recognize pretty well now what is going on. And um, here's the report from the Lost Valley. And that is, not too long ago, climate change was a bipartisan issue. And it stopped being a bipartisan issue dead in January of 2010, which not coincidentally aligned with the Supreme Court's decision in Citizens United, which allowed unlimited amounts of political money into our political system, and which was instantly deployed by the fossil fuel industry to go to the Republican Party and say, there's gonna be no more of this nonsense about climate change. All of you who are talking to Democrats about it, you're either gonna shut up or we're gonna get rid of you. And those of you who are gonna deny and obstruct will give you boatloads of money in 10, 20, 30 million dollar tranches through these new vehicles that we've set up uh, post Citizens United and you're gonna do things our way. And so all that bipartisanship that existed in 07, 08 and 09, my first years, just instantly evaporated. Why do I tell you that story? I tell you that story because that bipartisanship can be reclaimed. It was suppressed, but it can be reclaimed. And I am constantly talking to Republican senators about climate change and many are very receptive, but they don't see safe passage to supporting a climate bill because that same fossil fuel industry apparatus that has suppressed the Republican party's climate interest for a decade is still operating. And it's still operating with full force and with full vehemence and in my Lost Valley, it is a very proven predator. <laughs> it has the mechanisms, it has the money, it has the track record to put a very serious uh, fear, a very serious chill into any Republican who might dare cross it. So that's where the rest of corporate America comes in. And the dirty secret in my world is that the rest of corporate America has done zip, zero, nothing, nada, on climate for this lost decade. And in some cases, people might have had a pretty good reason why blow your goodwill with Republican senators in league with the fossil fuel industry by talking about climate change when you're gonna run up against 
a Trump who will veto and a McConnell who won't even bring up the bill. So to a degree that made sense, but that no longer makes sense. And it points to the prospect for a real solution now if the rest of corporate America actually shows up in Congress. And that means more than writing a letter to the editor. It means more than even having a lobby meeting. It means making sure that your corporate presence is determinedly pursuing climate action here in Congress. And until recently, that really didn't happen. Uh, corporations, even very green corporations, didn't show up to lobby about climate. They may have lobbied about tax or immigration or other issues, but on climate, even green corporations didn't show up. And their most powerful presence is through their trade associations, particularly the Chamber of Commerce, the Farm Bureau, the National Association of Manufacturers, American Petroleum Institute, all of which were just unanimously and remorselessly opposed to any serious climate legislation. So that has been blown up a little bit, and there are inklings of reform in those areas. There's new management at the chamber, and they've started to support a few small carbon bills. But we are not going to get serious climate legislation unless the corporate sector shows up in sufficient force to convince Republicans who spent a decade under the heel of the fossil fuel industry that they actually have safe passage to work on climate legislation without being run out of office. And that's the goal. It's a pretty simple one. Uh, the industries have the wheels to do it. The banking industry, the ag sector, financial services, the consumer facing industries. These are all really strong uh, industries and they know how to lobby when they want to. It's just a question of actually turning on the apparatus uh, that you have to make sure that it is doing uh, this job. Um, so I think, you know, the motivation is also clearly there, the threats of coastal property value crash, of carbon bubbles wiping out the financial sector. The threats are really deadly serious and um, corporate America is paying attention. But everybody needs to put their shoulder into this one because we may just have this Congress to work with a Democratic president, a Democratic majority leader in the Senate, and a Democratic speaker. So we have to uh, take advantage of this moment. And that means now is the time to lean in hard and make sure that the corporate voice is clearly and indisputably and determinedly on the side of climate action. So with that, I'll yield to questions and uh, turn this into a conversation. Thank you for hearing me out. Thank you, that, that's great. You know, one of our secret missions is to, maybe not so secret, um, is to really, you, you know, use our um, the power of our brands, our stores, you know, and, and the actions we're taking sort of to get our own house in order um, and to set bold goals that will help influence other sectors. So we want to, um, you know, be a model for other sectors to follow. We also want to join forces um, when that's appropriate and, 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 and participate together in these types of lobby days. We, we participate in series, BICEP Policy Network, and do yeah. a lot of work with sort of cross-sector um, uh, efforts like that one, which, which we love and um, we'll participate again in this year. So what, um, what from your perspective, um, you know, we, we talk a lot about um, the importance of bipartisanship for sort of, you know, durable, climate policy, um, what areas do you think seem ripe for bipartisanship on climate policy in this Congress? Like you said, we may just have this Congress. Yeah. Well, as, as you pointed out, Amy, we got a surprising amount of stuff into the end of Congress um, right. appropriations bill, the funding bill, and it really came as a surprise to everybody. The press were stunned who followed the stuff because we'd kept a lot of it quiet so as not to provoke the opposition. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a signal, and it was pretty much all bipartisan. So that's a pretty strong signal that there is some real um, bipartisan leanings here. Um, I think that when you deal with issues like oceans, there's some really strong sentimental as well as practical and scientific um, supports there for uh, working together in bipartisan fashion. Um, but at the end of the day, bipartisanship is largely going to be determined by what the Republican members of Congress think their base and their support network 
demands of them. And at the moment, that demand has been more or less entirely, um, you know, climate obstruction and climate denial. And that I think needs to change. The Outdoor Industries Association is a really good trade association in the way it presents itself to Congress, but it's a relatively small one. If you look at the dark money, the anonymous political spending uh, that came through the last decade since Citizens United, the three biggest vehicles for dark money into politics were the US Chamber of Commerce, which is the biggest by far, the um, Carl Rove dark money vehicle called Crossroads GPS, which obviously you know where they're coming from, mm -hmm. and the Koch political operation, K-O-C-H, not C-O-K-E, the Koch brothers, mm -hmm. political operation, Americans for Prosperity. Those are the three biggest funders that funnel dark money through into races, and it's well over $300 million. So that's a really powerful force. And because the chamber is the most powerful and biggest of those forces, turning it around is really important. So anybody who's a member of the Outdoor Industries Association and a member of the US Chamber of Commerce, this is not your local chamber of commerce, they're great. We always work with our local chambers really well. This is the national group that's been outed as a worst climate obstructor by influence map, along with the National Association of Manufacturers. And if you're a member of those organizations, you really need to lean in hard and make sure that they are reflecting your values and your priorities when they come to Congress. Because for the last decade, I'll tell you, they have not been. They have been exclusively reflecting the priorities and desires of the fossil fuel industry. Thank you for that. Yeah, no doubt there are some um, overlapping members. And when we talk about using our influence, that's exactly what we mean. You know, to me, um, uh, get, getting in and be able to have those conversations with the chamber slowly from the inside, you know, and really making change. We, we, we're kind of like, a, maybe I, I refer to our, uh, us sometimes as sort of like the small dog who thinks they're, they're really big. <laughs> so yeah. we, you know, um, we'll just continue to um, roll up our sleeves and do the hard work and, and um, appreciate that call to action about working with other, um, you know, uh, efforts like the chamber where our members may be dual members of, of both. So um, let's talk a little bit about this tool and what, you know, some of our members are probably familiar with and are seeing in the press um, this idea of budget reconciliation. Yeah. Um, can you just talk a little bit about that tool, um, what it is, why it might be important, if there are roadblocks uh, in taking some of the bipartisan routes um, yes. on, these, on these various issues? Um, under the Senate budget rules, if the Senate Budget Committee passes a reconciliation measure, it's called, then that measure instructs other committees like the Finance Committee or the Environment Public Works Committee or the Health, Education, Labor, Pensions Committee to send back legislation consistent with those instructions. And when that legislation comes back to the Senate floor, it has a privileged status to pass without filibuster with a simple majority. Um, and so it's been used on the Senate floor for pretty big things. We used it for the last piece of the Affordable Care Act of Obamacare. Mm -hmm. The Republicans used it to ram through their, what we politely call tax scam, the um, $2 trillion tax deductions for uh, the wealthiest Americans and the biggest corporations. Um, and we now have the option, we're using budget reconciliation right now on the COVID measure. And we have another one that we can use um, to do the next bill coming up, the Build Back Better bill, um, which will have a very significant climate component to it. And then we have a third one that's eligible, we're eligible for a year from now. So if we don't get everything we want in Build Back Better, we've got another opportunity. And what's important about that is that it helps us make sure that if we're going to do something bipartisan, it's real. And that the bipartisanship is not a box canyon designed to lure us in and then stop progress, but that it's real. And by keeping both lanes open so that we can act in a partisan way, in a unilateral way, if we must, 
we actually empower having a real, as opposed to a uh, Lucy pulling the football away from Charlie Brown, a bipartisan pathway. And I hope and I believe that our best way on climate is the bipartisan pathway. But if we say that's our only pathway, then those who are mischievously interested in derailing this will use that to stop it. So we have to keep both open. And that's why the reconciliation option is so important. It not only creates that, bipart that partisan option, but it also makes sure that um, the bipartisan lane is, is real, sincere, and, and strong. Thank you. Yeah, you, you mentioned um, um, uh, infrastructure and that is coming up, hopefully. Um, I just wanted to talk about that in particular because there's some, no doubt, there'll be lots of climate policy attached to that and things that we care about in the outdoor industry like EVs, charging infrastructure. Um, obviously, we care a lot about green infrastructure, more parks. Um, uh, some of the conservation work, land conservation work that could happen. And a big part um, of that also in, in terms of energy infrastructure, clean energy yeah. infrastructure. So I just wanted to get your take um, on whether, you, you know, uh, of some of those things or, or other things that may sort of get those, you know, goodies attached to an infrastructure bill. What, um, what do you see might be possible through that upcoming package on climate in any any particulars well I th nothing has been agreed to yet there's not even a very um rough outline yet mm, okay. um, we start off a very good highway bill that passed the environment and public works committee in the last congress unanimously all the republicans supported it with a big ev structure mm. component to it with a big coastal uh, infrastructure component to it with a climate title. The first time we ever got a bill out that actually had a climate change title in it. So that gives us, I think, a good start. There's a lot of work being done on energy efficiency and conservation. And that bill has been bottled up over and over again. And we can, I think, free that now that we're in the majority. There's enormous amount that can be done in uh, modernizing the electric grid making more room for efficiency, for uh, storage, for renewables, and also giving access to the grid to areas where it's really um, important to be able to help uh, very often native communities that have the space for wind and solar, whose traditional way of life is being compromised by climate change, um, whose agriculture and other um, economic inputs are being threatened uh, to have a clean energy business that they can go into in a big way. I remember going through the Wind River area of Wyoming over what looked to me as a New Englander like miles of wasteland with a hot sun beating down and a hard wind blowing. Yeah. And I thought, wow, you could do an enormous energy facility here. And I talked to the tribal leaders that I was meeting there about it. And they said, yeah, we could. It would be great for our tribe to do this, but we can't connect to the grid. Nobody will connect us. So you've got issues like that where you can combine some environmental justice and some economic support for beleaguered people uh, with the goals we all want to achieve of a, of a cleaner uh, energy sector. Yeah, fantastic. Good, well, we'll, we'll be tracking that closely and, and, and looking forward to it. I wanted to I ask- think To your members, think big, right? If you have ideas, don't think, oh, well, you know, they're just going to do something. We're going to try to do something big. And if there's stuff you want, you should be asking right now to try to get it into what I think will be a very big package. That's great. Yeah, we um, we're just, you know, kind of starting a series of meetings. So um, it's wonderful timing and we'll take your we'll take your advice to heart. I wanted to go back for a second. I, I um, you know, tying this kind of back to reconciliation a, a little bit and thinking about, you know, we still need moderate Democrats, um, like, like, like Senator Joe Manchin, um, to be, you know, we need to all work together on solutions. And just like you said, a lot of this will come down to sort of um, what, you know, not just Republicans, but also Democrats can really bring home to their districts. Um, and I'm just, I'm wondering if you could comment about how um, you, you maybe personally work with, with, with senators like Manchin to help find solutions on some of these things. Sure. Well, I mean, I've, I've been to West Virginia with Joe to get the 
tour mm -hmm. of um, his state's needs and his concerns and meet directly with people who are affected. And he's come to Rhode Island mm -hmm. to meet with Rhode Islanders and look at our coastal issues and go out with our uh, a trawler captain to hear about, hear the trawler captain say, this ain't my father's ocean any longer. Things are getting weird out here. I don't know where the fish are any longer or when they're gonna be here. Um, so I think the lines of communication are very open. Uh, I think Joe is uh, showing some real leadership in this area. I think if we don't make life difficult for him with our rhetoric and talk about the changes we want to bring in a way that are um, more comfortable to him, doesn't change the outcome. It's just not, you know, if we start calling this the Green New Deal, it's obviously gonna be a harder sell for him because of our rhetoric, not because of the substance. So we gotta use, I think, you know, sensible, good, helpful language for uh, the more moderate members. And then, you know, we're all here to help people. Yeah. And West Virginia is just brutally hard hit. So if we can find ways to bring economic development to West Virginia and to other hard hit states, if we can find ways to repair the damage to the labor unions, pension funds, to their health and welfare funds, if we can do things that, that honor the people who worked in those coal mines, they did hard and dangerous work that powered the American economy to the strongest economy in the world and they had no idea that anything wrong was happening because of it. And they shouldn't be blamed, they should be celebrated and we should maybe even think about talking about them as our energy veterans and take good care of them. And if you can put those kind of things together so people don't feel dishonored, don't feel frightened and have real economic results from the bill, then the fact that it also solves climate change is something that becomes, I think, quite palatable. That's great, yeah, it's all, yeah. The um, the triple win. Um, that's awesome. And I love, I love uh, the term energy veterans and finding ways to, to honor these, these communities, whether it's West Virginia or Wyoming or uh, many of them across the, the country. So maybe um, just a couple more questions. Thank you again for spending time with us today. Um, I'm, I'm curious whether we're seeing a, a lot of news kind of bubble up around um, a clean electricity standard, clean energy standard. We know Biden has um, a really ambitious 2035 goal. Um, is that out of the question? Is a clean energy standard, a national clean energy standard possible? I think it's very, I think it's very possible. I think um, there are a lot of things that are possible now. Um, I think it's important that we keep our eye on the ball here and not look at individual solutions, solution by solution and say, oh, we got a clean energy standard. Oh, we got a uh, modernized electric grid. Oh, we got EV infrastructure. At the end of the day, we've got to look at, are we on a path to 1.5 degrees tops for heating our planet? Are we gonna be able to leave a safe environment to the generations that follow? You know, we don't meet mother nature's standard then all the political benchmarks along the way don't matter one damn. And so we've got to keep our eye on that ball. So a clean energy standard is great, but a lot of electric utilities are already there and it only hits the energy sector. So if you really want to get to 1.5 degrees, what you're doing is you're focusing your attention on the sector that is doing the best in terms of reducing carbon, has set goals already consistent with a clean energy standard by and large. There are some outliers who have not, but many of the utilities have shown a lot of leadership and you're dealing only with that sector of the economy. So it's, you're never gonna solve the problem to 1.5 degrees with a clean energy standard. You've gotta be looking elsewhere and you've gotta be looking in some respects bigger. And actually you've gotta be looking at, I think my opinion, you gotta be looking at ultimately putting some kind of a price on carbon emissions because the International Monetary Fund says that the fossil fuel industry floats on a $600 billion annual subsidy. I said B, billion dollar annual subsidy in the United States alone. Every single year, $600 billion, mostly from the pollution harms, the quantifiable 
monetizable pollution harms that they get away with. So if you're not offsetting a subsidy of that magnitude, you're setting the course for climate safety steeply, steeply uphill. And if you can flatten that so that you're back to level competition, now the path to climate safety is level and smooth and gives renewables and a lot of other alternatives, including carbon capture and uh, reuse, a, a, a pathway. Yeah. Yeah, I'm. I'm. Uh, I was going to go there, and I'm glad. I'm glad you did. We had. Uh, I had a couple questions from specific OIA members that I just want to pull into the conversation to wrap us up. And one of them was related to uh, a price on carbon, and that was from Chris Valiante. He's the CEO of Twenty Two Designs, which is a small yeah. telemark bindings company based in Idaho. And um, he he was wondering what your thoughts were on the likelihood of of this Congress actually passing a price on on carbon. Um, We've been talking about that a while and working on that with Ceres. Um, so there's a specific bill he asked about the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act, but there's also your bill, um, the American Opportunity Carbon uh, Fee Act. So yeah. what what are what do you think about prospects there? This I think Congress? they're I think they're reasonably good. Um, there are four carbon pricing bills mm -hmm. in the Senate, um, at least as of the end of the last Congress, and I suspect they'll all be resubmitted. And they have a broader, everything from a cap and trade bill of Chris Van Hollen's to the White House shots, um, Heinrich Gillibrand bill that you mentioned to uh, a Kuhn's and Feinstein bill and a Durbin bill in the middle that start at lower carbon prices. And I think um, any of them could be written in a way to be effective, particularly in a larger package. And I'm less concerned about which way we go than that we keep in mind 1.5 degrees. And at the end of the day are doing the testing necessary to show that the law we're passing puts us on that trajectory. Because if it doesn't, we need to go back to the drawing board and add more. Um, so I think it's got a, a very good chance. I think that chance has improved if we're looking at 1.5 degrees as our, as our target and making sure we're really doing this about meeting nature's demands and not internal political demands in Washington, DC. And um, I think that we'll find, if we do robust carbon pricing, that it actually performs well better than the models suggest, because you can't predict innovation. But when you set a significant carbon price out there, you suddenly light up an entirely new potential industry to capitalize on that price. And um, so I'm very bullish on it. I think that we have the two tests are, will corporate America show up? Mm. Because if it doesn't, then it's not gonna be bipartisan, I don't think. And we're left going ahead on our own and it's a very different proposition then. And we gotta make sure that we have assuaged the concerns of the long overlooked environmental justice communities along the way. If we just come in and say, ta-da, we're doing a, a big carbon price, um, a lot of people are going to say, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Not so fast, pal. I've got local concerns. Um, you know, we're still breathing the mercury. We're still breathing the soot. Uh, we still have uh, a lot of uh, waste stored in our communities and we want solutions. So don't just be talking about carbon pricing. But I think we can, we can do that. We just, it's not going to be something that happens all by itself. It's got to be part of a balanced package. Right. Right, with all, with all the voices at the table yep. on the smart. So Everybody needs to know they were heard and fairly treated. Right. Um, well, then let, let me just wrap us up here um, with one more question from a member. This is from Jen Swain. She heads up sustainability at Burton Snowboards. Um, and just, you know, back to your sort of call to action for corporate America to show up. Um, can you just kind of in, in closing, um, and you've mentioned some of these as, as the conversation has gone on, but yeah. what, what role can and should uh, American businesses play? Um, and then specifically, you know, how can the outdoor industry, again, yes, um, we're smaller than some of these other sectors, um, but we've got bold ambition and, um, and we're ready to, to take bold action. So specifically, how can the business leaders, you know, and their teams um, who are listening today be helpful partners? Well, generally, I think you can keep doing what you're doing in terms of um, making this a part of your agenda, making this a part of your brand and your messaging, 
when you're working with people who are, um, you know, well-known athletes, um, try to use their fame and their reach to continue to talk about climate, continue to push your own sustainability. I think all of those things are very valuable and they help tilt just a little bit the national debate as more and more people. I noticed that watching the Super Bowl, there were a lot of very green advertising messages and a lot of very progressive advertising messages that I'm not used to seeing at um, those games. And so, you know, that was a good sign and you can keep doing that. But remember that Congress is the Lost Valley. We are a little ecosystem unto ourselves. There is no safe path on climate without Congress passing a bill. It is not a place you can overlook and say, oh, to hell with it, that's just the Lost Valley. We're gonna keep doing our thing. It really is important that your message come in to Congress and that we hear it clearly and that we understand how much this matters. And whether that's convening local representatives and senators to make the case, whether it's propagating the warnings about what goes wrong if we don't get this right, particularly the economic warnings, or whether that's the biggest thing of all, making darn sure that your trade associations are reflecting your views and your values. I think every major CEO in the country should commission an audit of their company's lobbying and electioneering, a political self audit. And I think most CEOs will be stunned to find that the political stance that they have de facto taken through their lobbyists, through their trade associations, particularly through the big trade associations, is directly contrary to what they believe. Yeah. And I think it's been surprising how few of the big CEOs actually have much awareness of what's going on in their company's name paid for by their company. Mm -hmm. um, and correcting that is a really, really big deal because in my lost valley, the super predators are the huge corporate trade associations, NAM, the chamber particularly, that's the biggest, API, the Farm Bureau. And while they're coming around and while they're a little bit less bloodthirsty than they have been in the past decade, they got a long way to go before Republicans look at them and say, ah, I have a friend if I do something on climate. Mm -hmm. And you got to understand that in the Lost Valley, the super predators really rule, particularly since it is united and they can marshal tens, hundreds of millions of dollars of dark money and pound people with it in elections, all of that. Whole separate problem of needing to fix that. Um, but at least as to climate, we've got to recognize that and try to um, either counterbalance the super predators or get them to knock it off and turn their super predatory behavior in the direction that their members seek. That's wonderful. Yeah, and I, you know, again, I, I, the Outdoor Industry Association, we sort of see ourselves as um, a, an association of, of leaders um, taking actions, uh, our members that taking actions that maybe um, um, other sect, you know, that are leading other sectors. And so to the extent that, that OIA um, can reach out to our fellow trade associations and be some offer something of a model um, for how to um, both take action across you know the businesses who are members but also bring that message to Congress give those Republicans say the safe passage um, that you described you know that's a great call to action for us and for our members so yeah and in places like Utah where they claim to have the greatest snow on earth and uh, Wyoming, where they have terrific, not only skiing, but also you know, hiking and packing and river running and all sorts of things. These are uh, fly fishing. Um, these are all activities that a lot of people value very, very deeply. And you have a huge natural constituency among people who love fly fishing, who live to ski, who can't let a summer go without going down a turbulent river. I mean, they just need to do these things. They love these things. It's part of who they are and engaging that passion to protect those resources and protect those um, activities, I think is a really powerful thing that you can do. And in my estimation, OIA is the best of the trade associations. So 
keep doing what you're doing. You've got a wonderful overlay between those activities and yet fairly red state folks where you can maybe make a difference. You don't need to convince us in Rhode Island to work harder on this. Um, but in a lot of the states where these activities are super important and super valuable to people, that message has not really been manifested by the uh, representatives. That's, yes, that's a great reminder. Thank you. We are united by nature. More and more Americans are getting outside now with the pandemic. So yeah. um, thank you so much, Senator Whitehouse, you, for, for joining us today. Okay, so once again, just want to thank um, the Senator for joining us this morning and all of you for listening in. Um, you heard the call to action, so you can expect um, advocacy opportunities, opportunities to engage uh, in as we head into the 117th Congress. Um, you can learn more about the Climate Action Corps at this link. We also have a few more upcoming virtual events um, on the Outdoor Retailer Winter Online platform, which you can find at this link. Thank you all for joining today. Take care.